I say, look here. The Leave it to Beaver show. I spent my entire childhood watching TV. I was, I was mesmerized and consumed by bland family sitcoms as a kid. Love Leave it to Beaver and Father Knows Best. And my teachers and my guidance counselor were saying, you're wasting your life. You're not going to go anywhere with that. That's not going to get you anywhere. And so I said, I'm going to make use of all that time. It's not just wasted time, it's research. I thought about what kind of show I would like to see, what kind of show would be successful on TV. Time for dinner. And all the things that turned me on as a kid that I didn't get to see or I got little glimpses of, I tried to put into The Simpsons. And I thought other people would like it too. Do you um, feel okay? I guess so. I feel a little vindicated, and yet I still hear those voices in my head. You know, you are wasting your life. <laughs> I had a pretty idyllic upbringing because my father was a cartoonist and filmmaker and uh, we had cartoon books throughout the house and my father uh, loved uh, animated cartoons. So I was inundated with pop culture uh, from as long as I can remember, from before I could read. I had the worst of all worlds, I think, because I was glued to the TV, I was totally addicted and yet I thought it was horrible. I mean, even as a kid, <laughs> I knew this was bad. I mean, I had my hopes. With each new fall season, when the new shows came on, I was like so excited. And then I would be so devastated when they, you know, I saw the actual shows. For instance, I was really, really excited by the premiere of the TV show Dennis the Menace, which came on, I believe, in 1960. And the show started out with this animated opening sequence with this uh, tornado, this human tornado coming, coming and spinning in. And then the name of the show was Dennis the Menace. There was a kid on TV who was a menace. I was so thrilled by the idea of any kid who was actually bad and naughty. And then it turned out to be this namby-pamby thing. I think the kid had a slingshot. I don't think he ever used it. Or they never showed him using it. So disappointed. Beaver, eat your Brussels sprouts. Leave it to Beaver. Great show. Very bland, very straight down the middle. Great acting. The best character? Not, not Beaver. Not, not his brother, but Eddie Haskell. Eddie Haskell was this mean, sarcastic, two-faced teenager who just m made me vibrate with happiness every time he was on screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to startle you. <laughs> oh, uh, that's all right, Eddie. Well, I hope I didn't interrupt whatever you were peeking at. We were peeking at Beaver, Eddie. We just wanted to make sure he finished his dinner, that's all. Well, I guess if you can't trust the child, you do have to spy on him. <laughs> and I thought, wouldn't it be neat to make a disobedient bad character the main character of a show? And I thought to myself as a kid, when that kid is older and he has his own kid, that kid should have his TV show and it should be called Son of Eddie Haskell. And Really, that's what The Simpsons is. Bart Simpson is the son of Eddie Haskell. I think out of all the TV shows that I watched as a kid, my most favorite was Ozzie and Harriet because there was something very real about the show. The, the people were really, really rigid and repressed and uh, uptight. All right, dear. Dig in. <laughs> what the heck is this? Well, you're only allowed 500 calories for dinner. I'm sorry, dear, but this diet was your idea. Well, I know, but... Holy smokes, you could drop this in your eye. For me, shows like Ozzie and Harriet have showed that you could take total normalcy, total bland, straight down the middle, middle American white blandness. My bland is the word that comes to mind. <laughs> and you can actually still have fun with it. You can actually do things with it. And in a way, The Simpsons is that mutated and transmogrified and, and taking into, into account some of the contradictions which were not acknowledged in television uh, at the time when I was watching it as a kid. 
the sitcoms uh, that I grew up with presented a sort of uh, a, a, a weird zombified ideal of the American family. And it didn't relate to anyone I knew in reality. How was everything today, dear? Terrible. What happened? Meetings with parents all day. As school principal, I can handle the children, but the parents get me down. And the people I knew in real life, they actually like smiled and laughed and did unpredictable things. And I thought, wouldn't it be neat to combine that yearning to do the right thing with the way people really acted? What I try to do as my life's work is to bridge the gap between the, the, the funny artifice that I saw on TV and what I knew was real. And I think that's partly the success of The Simpsons. The father figures in, in American sitcoms tend to be uh, congenial, uh, overweight uh, doofuses, you know, who are trying to do the right thing. Oh, you take a look at it. That clock is stopped. You know, something must be wrong with the power. The vacuum cleaner doesn't work either. Oh. Well, I, I don't know. I wonder what it could be. Could it be something that you did when you were fixing the porch light? No, I, I just uh, turned off the electricity and, and fixed the light and, and, and I... Uh... <laughs> You know, it, it's possible that uh, I neglected to turn the electricity. <laughs> that, that, that's that's exactly. With Homer, it's pretty much that, except that he's he's got more complex emotions. <laughs> you know, he he gets more angry. His 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 emotions are more extreme at either end, and he's really on a roller coaster, and he does really sharp turns. Those are the dads that I knew in real life. <laughs> And they were happy one minute, and then they were chasing their kids, you know, with murderous rage in the neck. I grew up in a suburban neighborhood in Portland, Oregon, and my dad had the weirdest job of all. I mean, everybody else's dad was normal and did normal stuff. My dad was a filmmaker and a cartoonist. I mean, that made no sense at all. He made surfing movies when I was a kid. I mean, first of all, Oregon, it rains a lot. How can you make a living doing movies about surfing. Well, he went to Hawaii, and he took us along uh, some of the time. <laughs> and so right away, everything was like a little estranged from the rest of the neighborhood. When I was 10 years old uh, in 1964, my father and I made up a story. We called it The Story. And it was the adventures of Lisa and Matt out in the woods meeting a series of animals and having little encounters with them. And my father made that into a movie and used as a soundtrack my sister Lisa telling my youngest sister Maggie the story. And he recorded it surreptitiously at night when they were supposed to be asleep. And they were telling bedtime stories and stuff. Once upon a time. The finished movie was shown in Portland, uh, and as a little kid, I got to see my big face on the big screen. It was really fun. My father grew up in a very conservative family, and he was able to escape and make wild surfing movies and crazy cartoons. And then I, as his son, was able to go a little bit further and, uh, you know, and do even wilder stuff. And uh, if there's any one particular person, I think, who made me what I am today, it's my dad. I grew up reading The New Yorker and Punch magazine for the cartoons, and uh, we had cartoon books throughout the house. 
In fact, uh, this, let's see, yeah, Ronald Searle, uh, an unbelievably great cartoonist. Here's a book called Souls in Torment, which I used to have as a kid. It's really uh, just amazing drawing, and uh, I would scrutinize these pictures, and they were, I was profoundly disturbed by them because very odd things were happening in these pictures. This is one of my favorite cartoons where it's uh, a hotel room and somebody's putting out human feet for the night instead of their shoes. Ronald Searle did a series of cartoons about St. Trinian's, this private girls' school where they really mistreated the girls and the girls were very, very bad. There was one cartoon in particular of a little girl hanging by her wrists in a dungeon while two uh, middle-aged women look in at her uh, through this uh, barred window and say, Little Maisie's our problem child. This is a very dark, disturbing cartoon. And as a kid, I loved it. And I spent part of my adulthood redrawing this cartoon in different form. I did this one, uh, it's with my character Bongo. Uh, always, uh, he's always tied up in a room by himself. And there's a little card here with a heart on it. And the two people looking through the door saying, the little fellow just won't respond to love. Now, this is about child abuse. It's about uh, neglect, and it's about uh, me ripping off Ronald Searle. <laughs> no, no, no! Why, you little... I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. whole history in school was like, just like a downhill slide from, from the very beginning of school. The first year, ah, I loved it. When I, once I learned how to read, fantastic. And then straight down. And by the time I got to high school, I was pretty miserable. I didn't like the rules. And, uh, you know, to be 14 in 1969 was the best time to be in high school because all this counterculture was going on. Great music, great anti-war protests. <laughs> People like uh, Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart and the Fugs, but mostly Frank Zappa. I mean, this album, this is absolutely free. This is this is uh, his second album, and uh, there's a, there's a line in here. Uh, uh, I got this album when I was 13 years old. This line: "She's only 13 and she knows how to nasty." And I thought, yes, someday, <laughs> someday that will happen to me. The great thing for me about the music of Frank Zappa uh, was that he would take all these different styles and put them all together. He was influenced by R&B and blues and Stravinsky and Webern and uh, Indian music, and he put them all together in one big funny mess, and he didn't take anything seriously, and uh, that, that uh, made a lot of sense to me when I was 14 years old. <laughs> And I feel very lucky, being exactly the age I am, it's just that for a moment in history, there was a bunch of kids at the same time who said, nah, we're not going for it. And what's really great is that after all these years, to find out that, hey, we were right. You know, right now, there is uh, there is no counterculture. You know, as far as getting attention, The Simpsons is it. <laughs> You know, when I was in high school, I was so upset by the grading system and by the unfairness and the rigidity of the rules that I vowed that I was never going to take another test again. And I was lucky. I found this school, the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. No grades, no required classes. Unfortunately, when you graduate, basically, you're on your own. 
I cartooned in college uh, and, and wrote a lot of fiction, and I edited the school newspaper and wrote a lot of articles, and, and that's where I met Linda Berry, who was one of my biggest influences, and Charles Burns, and, and a bunch of other kids who were all alienated. Every creative weirdo in the Pacific Northwest all like, gra you know, gravitated toward this, towards this school and uh, hung out there. It was fantastic. We are stars. We are golden, and we've got to get ourselves back to the Linda Berry was drawing more about what the world was really like and really funny and she's absolutely brilliant. At the same time, Charles Burns, also a brilliant cartoonist and uh, probably one of the greatest uh, draftsmen uh, working today, and, uh, and he does his own take on childhood which is uh, even more horrific. <laughs> I think what's great about pop culture and working in pop culture is that you can take media that in the past has been devoted to kids, comic strips, comic books, animated cartoons, and now begin to say some really unpleasant truths about the reality of growing up. I think the appeal of cartoons is their handmade quality. Regular writing that's typeset is edited, and you can't tell how many hands have, have uh, messed with it. But a cartoon in a newspaper is generally hand-drawn and hand-lettered. And to me, cartoons and newspapers are like little windows. They're like, you know, there's all these gray columns of type of grim reality and, and, uh, and, and unpleasantness. And then you get these little frames of joy. That's what cartoons are to me. Handmade, undiluted. What, what was great about Charles Schultz is he showed that you could work with very few lines and uh, very simple ideas and still say things that actually had some resonance. And I, I was very inspired by that as a cartoonist. Peanuts is really an amazing comic strip, particularly early on when it was really about some of the grim realities of childhood and about loneliness and heartbreak. I mean, when you, when you think about Charles Schultz and his work, it's about unrequited love. Everybody is in love with somebody else who's in love with somebody else, you know? And uh, I, I think the, the strip with as few lines as it has, is one of the great uh, uh, works of the 20th century. I finally got out of school in 1977 and I headed immediately for Los Angeles because I figured like, you know, here is the center of all the garbage that the rest of the pop culture consumes. And I thought everybody here would be really sophisticated about it. I mean, they've got to, this is where it's made, so they got to know what, you know, garbage it is. And I got here and the crazy thing about LA is they believe it more here than anywhere else in the world. It's amazing. You know, you talk to people about these movies, and you think that they're kidding. And they, no, they really like this stuff. People here really like those movies. They really do. Those TV shows, those lousy TV shows, they're proud of them. I, I'm not kidding. I'm not, I'm not kidding. 
LA is great if you have a lot of money. I had no money. I had a bunch of lousy jobs. I was very angry and upset with myself and with the way my life was turning out. And so I started drawing a comic strip called Life in Hell. And I did it as a little Xerox, tan staple comic book I would do in my crummy little apartment in Hollywood with the sirens and the police helicopters outside, you know, late at night. And, and I would be just fueled with rage and desperation and existential angst about my situation. Hence the title, Life in Hell. There's a lot of humor in our culture about childhood, and um, over the years, we're being able to be a little bit more real uh, about what really goes on with children. And the fact is, kids are full of fear. And I try to explore some of children's real fears and real neglect and real abuse and still try to find some humor in it. <laughs> You know, the way I started out, I was a huge fan of Charles Schultz and Peanuts. And my friends and I used to draw uh, Charlie Brown. And um, this is how he came out when we drew him. That was basically the, the first character I drew. And gradually, Charlie Brown transformed into a character with a big nose and two eyeballs on the same side of his head. They still had Charlie Brown's T-shirt on. Anyway, so, and this character was named Joe. Eventually, over the years, Joe got a fez and changed his name to Akbar, and I gave him a little ear, and then I gave him a twin. And uh, so this, these are my characters, Akbar and Jeff. <laughs> My main two characters in Life in Hell are Binky, who is this uh, uh, sort of version of me, very anxious and uh, um, and uh, stressed out. And then he's got a girlfriend who's basically Binky and drag. This is sort of modeled after uh, Minnie Mouse. Now Minnie Mouse is just basically Mickey Mouse with, with eyelashes and a ribbon. So, so that's Sheba. That's his girlfriend. And I used to do comic strips with, with Binky and Sheba and arguing about their relationships. And my girlfriend at the time would go, you know, that's not fair, you know, to, to you know, because you're doing both sides of the argument and you, the, you make the girl come off uh, worse. So that's when I put Akbar and Jeff into the strip, two identical creatures, and I'd have them have the same arguments that I was having with my girlfriend, and you couldn't tell who was who. Except again, my girlfriend at the time said, you think you're Akbar, but you're really Jeff. So I did Life in Hell as a comic strip for the Los Angeles Reader, a little weekly newspaper, and gradually got picked up by other newspapers and stuff like 250 papers around the country and, and overseas. I have this theory about what's memorable in cartoon characters, and that's if you can identify them by silhouette. For instance, Mickey Mouse, 
Batman. So when it came time to create The Simpsons, it, each character I decided to see if I could draw them and make them identifiable in silhouette. Why, it's Bart Simpson. So, yellow skin, why? Because it looks like there's something wrong with your TV set, and I thought that was appropriate to The Simpsons uh, symbolically. Also, if you're flicking around with your channel changer very fast and you zoom by The Simpsons, there's nothing else that looks like them on TV, so. Therefore, we stand out. I looked at Walt Disney's cartoons, I thought there's no way. It's great, but it's got this kind of rubbery, bouncy thing that I found a little bit nauseating. I mean, it's great, but it's a little, you know? And then there's Warner Brothers, that's like, mm, mm, you know, it's very dynamic and jerky and quick and brilliant. But I thought, no way. The budgets in today's animation, you can't do it. But Rocky and Bullwinkle, unbelievable cartoon. First of all, horrible animation, terrible shoddy, missing frames, nothing matches, everything like that, but it's got great writing, it's got great voices, and it's got great music. And I thought to myself, that's what you need. You don't need to have great animation. And with The Simpsons, I used Rocky and Bullwinkle, uh, Bullwinkle as a model. Well, our heroes are now in Pennsylvania, a country where everybody's a spy and everything's a secret. And what's more, last time when our boys opened the door to their room, they found it in a dreadful condition. Bullwinkle instantly made a brilliant deduction. Somebody's been in here. I know, because when we went out, this blocker was facing the other way. I named the Simpsons after members of my own family. My father's name is Homer. My mother's name is Margaret, sort of like Marge. I have a sister, Lisa, and a sister, Maggie. And I named the Simpsons after them, not because the Simpsons are like them in real life. I thought it would be a funny little conceit. Unfortunately, the Simpsons continues on and on and on. And so my family has to uh, live with... Uh, <laughs> with their uh, uh, unwitting fame. My father only complained to me once about The Simpsons. He, he didn't mind anything that they did. He just was upset one time. The Simpsons' car was, uh, got a flat tire out in the desert, and Homer had Marge carry the flat tire back to town and, and while he and the kids waited in the shade. <laughs> My dad said, uh, Homer shouldn't have done that. And I said, come on, Dad, come on. Homer strangles his kids. You've never complained about that. So, but he didn't mind that for some reason. <laughs> I was a huge fan of animation the whole time I was growing up. The Flintstones and the rest of the Hanna-Barbera cartoons, I, I, I was addicted to and I watched a lot of them, but they were very formulaic and, and very, again, more in that TV, you know, narrow boundaries and nothing unsafe. The reason why I turned out the way I did is not because of any uh, great uh, positive ambition. It's, I had no choice. I had to be what, I, what I'm doing. I'm not, the fact that I got successful at it, it, that's lucky, that's good. But I would be doing the same thing whether or not I were successful. Uh, I, I, I just love cartooning and love writing, and luckily I get to do it and get paid for it. I have got two successes with Futurama and The Simpsons. If I do another one, it's like, oh my God, when do I sleep? You know. So I'm considering very carefully, but maybe I'll do Life in Hell in an animated form. I'd love to do that. But just, I would write the whole thing myself. Okay? Wouldn't that be good? Actually, I, yeah, okay. And then not for the camera. I have this idea for a rock and roll show. I want to do, okay, let's put this on camera. Let me put this on camera. I got these big ideas, okay? But The Simpsons was my idea of the American family and celebrating the American family at its wildest. You know, people who love each other and drive each other crazy. And with Futurama, it's taking the idea of the future and science fiction and doing to science fiction what needs to be done to science fiction. I have the secret project that I want to do. I want to, I want to demolish rock and roll. I want to, I want to do to rock and roll what I did to the American family, okay? I, ha I have this great idea for a show. And uh, even though I've given it away now, uh, uh, nobody knows exactly what I'm going to do. It's going to be good. It's going to be good.